Hey, Black Hat Studio here, looking at the new league upcoming for Path of Exile, Trial of the Ancestors. Path of Exile content has slowed a bit on my channel, and that is because the, my league has ended. That's okay though, because I do intend to play the next league, which in, is in about two weeks time as of the recording of this video. And I want to just look over all the new stuff that's coming. I haven't actually had a chance to look at any of this yet, so we're going in blind together. Okay, Path of Exile, Trial of the Ancestors. In this expansion, you will visit the Kauri Afterlife and defeat 10 tribes in a series of tournaments to earn valuable new rewards. Our August expansion introduces the Trial of Ancestors Challenge League, 16 new Atlas Keystones, reworks of the Guardian and Chieftain Ascendancy classes, 14 new support gems, holy shit, and the return of a fan favorite past league, the Forbidden Sanctum. I'm surprised to bring back the Forbidden Sanctum because it was like a very special game mode being that it doesn't use the same attack, like the same damage set up like health and board and energy shield like it just it's almost like its own game. So it's very interesting they brought that back and I'm looking to see how they rework it because I doubt they brought it back in its completely original form. Journey of the Kauri Afterlife. The fallen chieftains of each Kauri tribe participate in a tournament called the Trial of the Ancestors. You will journey to their afterlife to compete against these tribes by assembling your own team of Kauri warriors. You'll battle their chieftains in the tournament to earn valuable rewards. Enter the tournament. In this league, use tradable silver coins. Oh, the silver coins are coming back. To gain passage to the Kauri afterlife. You'll start out with the basic team of three Kauri warriors to enter the trial of the ancestors. In each match, you can select which tribe to compete against based on the rewards offered. You can examine the battlefield configuration of the enemy team and strategically place your warriors to challenge theirs. Then you and your party will compete alongside your warriors to destroy the opposing team's totems and win the match. Some of your team. When you compete in tournaments, you'll accumulate favor with each of the tribes. This can be spent on recruiting warriors and purchasing field items and equipment to power up your team. Each tribe has their own specialties and you can mix and match warriors from different tribes to build a team that embodies your strategy. Oh. Why does this look like tabs? Totally accurate battle simulator. This almost looks like an auto battler. So you kind of get to be like just a soldier or like a high ranking soldier in like an army from the looks of it. That's kind of crazy. Cast the title wage, trolls for. Oh, so you can place totems yourself. Okay, that makes sense. And also is extremely cool. What? Oh, that must be from the totem. Oh, uh, there is an attack I don't recognize there as well as the punishment mark looks different there. Is that a new skill? Or did they just change the icon, maybe? Adorn your soul. You may earn rewards for each match you win. In addition to a selection of regular items that may be offered, there are some exclusive new rewards that you can only get from the Trial of the Ancestors. Passive tree tattoos are one such reward. Oh dear god. <laughs> We have so much stuff modifying our passive tree already. These are not applied to your skin, but are instead engraved on your soul. Applying your tattoo will change what the attribute skills on your passive tree do. Oh, the small passives. If you win the entire tournament, Hinakura can also offer you a new type of item called an omen. They can be stored in your inventory until condition is met, at which point they will be consumed and an effect occurs. It can only consume one o omen per combat area. She may also offer a lock of her hair, which allows you to foresee the results of an item crafting outcome. Like, you can see what will happen if you annul an item? Because if that's the case, this will be worth more than the squire, probably. <laughs> Unless it's really common, but like that would make this an essential item in any crafting. Allows an item to foresee the result of the next currency item used on it. Modifying the item in any way removes the ability to foresee. I can't stress enough that that sounds exactly like it'll just tell you what will happen next. I really, really hope this is more common than it sounds because 
we need more deterministic crafting in this game. This game does not benefit from having as little deterministic crafting as it does. I don't know why the devs are borderline phobic of deterministic crafting, but it is very bad for the game. Okay, replaces a small strength passive skill, grants 5% fire resist. Okay. Trigger a level 20 summon spirit of Utula on taking a savage hit from a unique enemy. Limit one loyalty tattoo. Okay, so there are multiple loyalty tattoos then? Oh, there can only just be one of this, I guess. Okay. Because this doesn't. None of these others say loyalty tattoo, they just say tattoo, honor tattoo. Grants movement speed, uh, adds lightning damage. Increase reservation efficiency. Okay, that's going to be the most expensive of all the tattoos. <laughs> Just full stop. It's going to be like prismatic catalysts. Uh, plus, replace a plus 30 to intelligence notable skill. Grants plus one to level of all intelligence skill gems. Holy shit. Okay, never mind. This is going to be the prismatic catalyst of all of them. Hell, that, that's not even... It's not even... No, that's going to be worth so much money. <laughs> like, there's... I feel like there's very few builds that that wouldn't help in if you use even 50% of your gems as intelligence gems. That could be so good. Well, actually, not every skill scales well with gem levels, so there is that, but still, it just, it's very desirable. On death, the omen is consumed and a portal to town is created. Okay, so it automates portals. Upon reaching 25% life, this omen is consumed and recovers all flash charges. Okay, recovers flash charges. Cool. Leveling up, this omen is consumed and you gain soul eater. That's a... It's a stacking flat buff to... Something with flask, like flask effect or something? I can't remember. Using an orb of chance on an item, it will become unique if possible, and this omen will be consumed. Oh. Each player can only consume one omen in each combat area. Okay. So what this sounds like is that there's borderline no reason to not have an omen on you at all times, if this is what it sounds like. Well, okay. I guess money would be the obvious thing, is if they're too expensive, but like... I can't think of a time, in general, with most builds where omen or refreshment would be bad. Like, that's just really good. Just straight up. I think the only problem would be whether how quickly you can obta like obtain these or not. I mean, something as simple as the Omen of Refreshment would be a like, could be the difference in defeating an uber boss. So, so that seems pretty ridiculous. I do wonder if it's going to be limited so that you can't use them in like uber boss fights and stuff, or if this is just going to make the fights easier. In general, I don't believe that making the fights like I don't believe that making the game easier is a bad thing in general because you can always re restrict yourself with self-imposed restrictions, so there's always challenges that you can make for yourself. There's no reason to, like, force everything to be challenging, necessarily. Okay, claim exclusive unique items. Each of the ten Kauri tribes guards an exclusive unique item that embodies the essence of their tribe. These valuable heirlooms can only be earned by defeating that tribe in the Trial of Ancestors. Hirakor, the goddess of death, also has... Four powerful, unique items that may be offered to the winners of the tournament. Okay, so that means there's 14 uniques. And these are three of them. Bound Fate. Okay, so it's a cloth belt. Dex, Int, Max Life. Oh, wow. Okay, every five seconds, gain one of the following for five seconds. So it's a rotating buff between... Your, your hits are always critical strikes. Hits against you are always critical strikes. Attacks cannot hit you. Attacks against you always hit. Your damage with hits is lucky. Damage with hit hits against you is lucky. Oh. This is... 
a real dice roll then. <laughs> yeah, so you have a 50% chance of getting something bad. I guess if you have crit damage reduction, then the first negative doesn't really matter. The second negative doesn't matter as much. Actually, I don't think it matters at all if you're not an evasion build, because, like, things are always going to hit you anyways. So that doesn't really matter. Unless, like, something has very poor accuracy. But I wouldn't think that most creatures would have poor accuracy in general. At least, anything that's dangerous enough certainly won't. And damage of hits against you is lucky. I mean, that can be mitigated, but in general, that, that would be good against most builds. I don't know, that feels like the main drawback of the item. Though, I mean, the main drawback of the item is that three of six options are either negative or neutral. And you're using a slot for this, so there's that. Oh god, uh... Arahongi's Tending. Coral Amulet. Life regen, mana regen... Flask life recovery, mana... Flask life recovery... Or mana flask recovery. Life flask will use on low life, apply your recover instantly. Mana flask will use on low mana, apply recovery instantly. Okay, so it just allows you to recover more mana instantly. Okay. That doesn't seem powerful enough to dethrone most of the things that would sit in that slot, but maybe there's a build that needs it. Kadava's Hunger. Increased armor. That's... Oh, that's a chest plate. Thousand armor is not a huge amount for a chest plate. You can't even see the range of it either, which is kind of bad. Oh, 850 to maximum life, but there are no life modifiers on any other on other equipped items. And it has sockets! Holy shit. Okay, so the trade-off for having basically no armor on this, comparatively to other, other armor chest pieces, is that you have a truly obscene amount of life and you still have sockets, unlike Combs Heart. I feel like this might actually... Well, no, because Combs Heart, you can still use other things with life on it, with it. But the trade-off is that there's there's no sockets. Okay, I think this holds its own. It definitely has some place in the game. That's cool. Turn to the Forbidden Sanctum. Okay, so what are they going to do to this? After meeting Divina in Act 10, you will find Sanctum items while playing maps in the endgame. These tra tradable items each represent a whole floor of the Sanctum. Upon successfully completing that Sanctum Floor, the next floor is generated as a tradable item with all your boons, afflictions, and resolve states built in. You, we have rebalanced the Forbidden Sanctum to provide more variety in the mechanics and monsters you encounter. Most notably, your primary character defenses are now able to protect your resolve. Relics have also been rebalanced and are now tradable. Okay. That sounds like something kind of similar to, like, how Alva Temples are now tradable. And Forbidden Tome. Take this Forbidden Tome to Dafina. Okay, so I assume that's just the, the item that opens it. Okay, so... Basically, you can play the Forbidden Temple like... Maps! If you make enough money in it through trade, you could potentially sustain only doing the Sanctum stuff. So once you've leveled up enough, you don't actually need to map, potentially. Like, because you can just buy more tomes with the gear, like, with the gear and rewards that you get from the Sanctum itself. Which means, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because before you would have to go through a map to find the Forbidden Sanctum, you could fully have a character that can't map or boss necessarily except in the sanctum and it's focused on the sanctum fully just in the same way that you can have a character that's focused fully on heist and then have them be power leveled using the money that you gain that is good for the game 100 percent it is very good to have alternate game modes we have the rogues harbor where you can spend you can just do heists instead of mapping. We have mapping as the normal endgame. We have lots of bossing as the normal endgame. We have delve as its own full thing. 
And now we have the Forbidden Sanctum. That's really good to have a third, I guess fourth, like potential endgame area. Like endgame pursuit. Something to build your entire character around. Because people build entire characters around heist. They build entire characters around delving. They build entire characters around bossing and mapping. So doesn't that mean that we can build entire characters around this much easier and we don't have to worry about running through a map in whatever way that we end up doing that? Because, like, you wouldn't need life on your gear or anything necessarily if it doesn't help you resolve. You could definitely make a character that's just, like, unable to map but, like, destroys the Sanctum. That's... This is a really cool concept. And I really, really appreciate it. Customize your endgame. Trial of the Ancestors includes 16 new keystone passives to unlock the Atlas Passive Tree. To unlock on the Atlas Passive Tree. The keystones allow you to put double down on content that you want to play and offer control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the exact same as it was before. Become possessed by a tormented... Wait, hold on a second. That's not the same. You can craft of all side areas, become possessed by a tormented spirit, place a single giant, gigantic explosive charge in Expedition, or play any Kyrick Mard regardless of what he offers you. Okay, all of that sounds fun. And I don't really like the Vol side areas or Expedition or Tormented Spirits, so if I could make those fun, I would definitely play those. Let's see what the actual thing is. 200% increased explosion radius, 100% increased explosion placement range, Expedition monsters on your map spawn with an additional 10% life missing. Number of explosives is one. That actually sounds amazing because I hate going around and placing all the explosives. So having just one, I can just plop down wherever I want and then just go. That sounds really nice. That would make me like an expedition way more. Lucid dreams. Vault side areas in your map are no longer corrupted. Oh, so you can apply currency to them like strong boxes. Oh, that's awesome! Okay! Okay, that's cool! Destructive play. The Maven summons one to three additional bosses when witnessing map when witnessing map bosses. Modifiers to the final map boss on each map also apply to these summoned bosses. Oh my gosh! You could have eight bosses. If you get your main map boss, which is one three additional map bosses which is four and then if you get twinned you get eight. Oh my gosh that would be so fun <laughs> oh i want to do that so badly oh my gosh that also means that you would get four witness uh yeah you'd witness four bosses in one map in that case that's really cool because on average, you'd be getting about one and a half bosses added per map, if my calculations make sense. That's two and a half bosses a map. Basically, every four maps, you would be able to do... You theoretically would be able to do a new Maven's Invitation. Assuming that none of them overlap. And also that you get lucky. Well, not lucky. As soon as you have average luck. That's cool. I really like these. These are good... These are good changes because there's a lot of keystones that I just do not give a shit about. And it's cool to see this stuff come up. I imagine the, the rest of the keystones aren't as, like, crazy amazing as these are. But whatever. Discover new support gems. As part of this expansion's metagame rebalance, we've introduced 14 new support gems. These gems have been designed to take existing categories of skills and provide new, entirely new ways of playing them. Perfect. For example, making your war cries deal damage, having your projectiles return to you, or causing your totems to launch fiery mortars at enemies that hit them. Oh my gosh, imagine if you could just do like some sort of like self damage on the totems and have them just launch random mortars or something. I mean, they'll probably do something to prevent that, but still. Also, damaging war cries, that could. You, there, there's some fun things you could make with that. You could make an entire war cry build. Okay, so this makes your projectiles return, and Bridge Bond. Support skills, damage and chill enemies between you and link targets. Deal cold damage, to linger, spell damage modifiers, support, support skills damage over time effect. 
if you're able to guarantee that you'll have someone to play with, this actually could be really fun to work around, because I feel like there aren't enough things where you can scale cold damage over time. So that's kind of cool. Guard your allies. The Guardian Ascendancy class has been revamped to bring it more in line with the modern power level of other Ascendancy classes. It still keeps its focus on synergistic party play, but with many more exciting options. Harmony of Purpose now powers up parties using Link skills. Cool. Time of Need now completely heals and cleanses you every 4 seconds. Radiant and Unwavering Crusade both fully embrace the Holy Summoner theme by giving you access to some exciting new types of minions that are exclusive to this Ascendancy class. Ooh. Okay, Harmony of Purpose. And also damage with your hits dealt by allies between you and Link targets is lucky. And elemental damage with hits dealt by allies between you and Link targets. So you have to have three people to do that? Allies between you and Link targets have plus 5% to all maximum elemental resistances. Enemies between you and Link targets cannot apply elemental ailments. Oh. That sounds like it has a very niche use considering that you have to cover someone with the beam? From the sounds of it? That doesn't sound very useful. If this was being applied to someone directly through a link? Yeah. But someone being between you and link targets? That sounds like a positional nightmare. You'd have to like be very much in tune with the person who you're playing with. I, I don't know. Bastion of Hope. If you've attacked recently, you and nearby allies have plus 25% chance to block attack damage. If you've cast a spell recently, you have spell block. Okay, yeah, that is a solid good option. That is good. Oh, I just noticed that a lot of these say allies, not party members, which means that you don't necessarily need a third person, you just need minions or you need a person who you can connect to and then have minions in between i don't know that that seems almost worse because minions move very sporadically and they move when you move so if you move to reposition to move to put them in the right position they'll move to reposition to be near you which sounds awful to be honest <laughs> okay uh radiant faith Grants armor equal to 25% of your reserved mana to you and nearby allies. Grants energy shield equal to 10% of your reserved mana to you and nearby allies. Okay. I feel like that's a lot better than before. Wait. Grants armor equal to 25% of your reserved mana. Well, if you're... You, let's say you have an, like, an obscene amount of mana reserve. Let's say you have 4,000. That would be 1,000 armor. I guess it'd be a thousand flat armor, which I mean, flat armor is way better in that case. And max energy shield equal to ten percent. That would be four hundred energy shield. Yeah, that's flat. That's pretty good. I think discipline only gives you like two hundred and twenty, two hundred and thirty raw energy shields around level twenty to other people. So that actually would be like another discipline aura once you exceed 2000 percent reserve mana that's actually really good unwavering faith auras from your skills grant five percent increased rate of life for life mana and energy shield to you and allies oh each aura does okay so if you're an aura bot with 10 auras then that's 50 percent increased recovery but it says the way that it says recovery rate what does that affect? So I assume that would probably affect flasks, and it might aff affect regen. Would it affect life recoup? That could be really powerful depending on how it actually turns out. Time of need. Every four seconds, remove curses and elements, elements on you. Every four seconds, regenerate 100% of life over one second. Okay, that's cool. The unfortunate thing about time of need is that as far as I'm concerned, curse removal is useless. 
because the most dangerous curses that you encounter are the ones that are on maps or just like they're just on an area and you can't remove those you need to become curse immune to prevent those so that's kind of useless and elemental ailments well if you get frozen and it lasts for four seconds let's say that you're halfway there to removing your elemental ailments and you're frozen two seconds of being frozen that's you're dead you're dead it doesn't matter you're dead like like it may be if you have a tanky build and like this is obviously a pretty tanky build but like i don't know i don't feel like i, I feel like four seconds is like cruel and punishing almost like if that was dropped down to three maybe but like i wouldn't i would be concerned relying on that the, the regenerate life though is pretty fucking good especially if that is affected by recovery rate because if you have let's say a 50 percent increased recovery rate that'd be 150 percent of life regenerated over one over one second which is really nice because i mean you can lose life in that time so that would have a chance to bring you back to full life even if you do lose another 50 percent of your life while regenerating that life i mean that's very situational but you know gradient crusade Grants level 20 Summon Sentinel of Radiance skill. 10% of damage from hits is taken from your Sentinel of Radiance's life before you. Okay. 25% chance to trigger Summon Elemental Relic when you or a nearby enemy... No, nearby ally kill the enemy. So Elemental Relics, I assume, would be very simple, similar to the Holy Relics. I don't really know what the Elemental effect is, but that's interesting. Sentinel Radiance. So that's that's really interesting to me. If your Sentinel Radiance can take 10% of your damage, like of the damage you take away from you, is there a way to increase the number of Sentinels of Radiance and do they each do that for you? Because if they each take 10%, then if you get a bunch of them, that could be a lot. Like that is a 10% damage reduction just straight up right there assuming that it doesn't murder your sentinels but i mean i assume the sentinels would have to be decently strong if they're going to be paired with that skill just because like no matter what you can't get away from the fact that they will be taking 10 percent of your damage so they have to they're they have to compensate for that i am very interested in what the elemental relic does though because that sounds we don't have very many ways of giving minions the chance to do damage over time effects. It's possible if they make a damage over time aura or they deal damage over time themselves that we might actually see uh, dot minion elemental dot minion builds start to become an actual like a bigger thing. And that could be really cool because that would open a new build archetype. Harness the Cowrie's Flame. You've We've completely redesigned the Chieftain Ascendancy class. It offers all new passive skills, many of which focus on themes of fire and other elemental damage, alongside specializing in totem strikes and slams. That sounds like the exact same thing as we had before. Though we didn't have other elemental damage before, so that's kind of new. Uh, actually, I don't think we had anything for strike skills specifically either, it was just slam skills. Its new skills let you cause enemies to explode, turn off enemies' fire resistance while you're stationary, convert passive skills to apply to fire damage, and have your fire resistance apply to your cold and lightning resistance, among many other abilities. Oh my gosh, does it still have the 100% lightning or fire resistance? Modifiers to maximum fire resistance also apply to maximum cold and lightning, okay. Fire resistance, modifiers fire resistance, applies to cold lightning, resists at 50% of their value, unaffected by ignite. I don't see the fire element. Okay, I don't see the fire resistance increase that was there before, but it's pretty easy to get increased maximum or otherwise fire resistance. So, like in the chieftain area, so the marauder area. So that's pretty. That's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I, I really like that. I think that'll be 
really awesome because that'll help you be able to like focus on fire specifically and like kind of let the rest of it work itself out that also means that if you have nothing affecting your cold or lightning resistance and all of it comes from your fire resistance then you could use a wise oak flask very well if you're a fire build because your highest resistance will be your fire and you'll be able to penetrate elemental resistance with that and then your two lowest resistances would be cold and lightning tied because if there's nothing else affecting them then they would be equal if they're getting all of it from the fire resistance modifier which would mean that you would have reduced damage from both of them that i feel like wise oak after its nerf like kind of lost a lot of its a lot of love for it so that's that's cool that is that has the potential to be really cool i also like the fact that we don't have to just build the same try resist stuff on every single piece of gear now because that also means that more varieties of gear will be valuable hinakora death's fury enemies you kill have a five percent chance to explode dealing 500 percent of their maximum life as fire damage usually it's like 10 percent of their maximum life 500 percent is ridiculous I kind of want to play with that just for mapping because that's fucking awesome. Arongi Moon's Presence. I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but let's just assume it is. Recoup 10% of damage taken by your totems as life. Okay, okay. Totems will generate one life per second per four of your life recovery per second from regeneration. Okay. Totems taunt enemies around for four seconds when summoned. Ooh, that is a nice, that's a nice defensive layer. Because you can make totems take damage. There's a pair of boots that make your totems deal damage to themselves. And then there's the, oh, there's, no, that's from minions. There's a minion skill gem that does, that does something similar to that as well. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, there's so many builds you can make with that. That I, I think that's really awesome. And it'll even support just any general totem builds. This might actually replace... Or not replace, but like, give a good runner up to the Hierophant for totem builds. Because currently, totem builds often seem to go Hierophant because of the extra maximum totems. But this would make you way tankier. So this, this actually gives you some real benefit for going into it. Namahu. Flames Advance non-unique jewels cause increases and reductions to other damage types in a large radius to be transformed to applied to fire damage okay so anywhere where there's just jewels that aren't unique will have some sort of buff that also means that you're free to put whatever rare like Actually, that means you're free to put any magic or rare jewel in there that you want. That's interesting. That actually might bring out... That might have some synergy with the 5 and 6 passive Abyssal Eye jewels that you can get from a keystone on the Atlas Tree. Because then you could have a 6 passive jewel that also has that bonus effect. Because, like, obviously you're going to want to find a way to make that rare jewel as effective as possible because like it already is going to have a general effect like a generally a good positive effect from just existing so how you can get the best value out of it without it being a unique there's there's some some ideas there tawo force strength trigger level 20 tau is chosen when you attack with a non-vol slam or strike skill near an enemy okay so that used to just be non-vol slam skill. Have it, adding strike to that is nice because there isn't... I think this is actually the first support that strike skills have gotten in any ascendancy. Which is pretty nice because they certainly deserve it and strike skills could be a lot cooler than they currently are. So I like that. 
And the next one after that, Tukahama Wars Herald. Skills from equipped body armor are supported by level 30 Ancestral Call and level 20 Fist of War. Okay, so the Ancestral Call will is meant to boost strike skills, and the Fist of War is meant to boost slam skills, but neither of them overlap with each other. But, like, they're both extremely valuable. Like, you're going to want a Ancestral Call unless you find some other way to increase the number of strikes that you can get from your strike skills per attack. And I don't think I've seen a situation where you don't want Fist of War for any slam skill because it just gives you an additional slam, which is amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> And finally, Ramako, Sun's Light. Nearby enemies have no fire resistance against damage over time while you are stationary. That is really cool. And the reason why I say that's really cool is because if you can put aside all elemental penetration and all damage reduction to damage over time, you might actually be able to use the channeling skills that cause you to be stationary effectively. Because so many of those skills, you're, you're just punished for not moving in Path. Path is a game where you need to move constantly. This is It's not a game where you stay stationary. So having such a huge damage, bu damage buff when you're stationary that might actually make it worthwhile enough that you can just focus on investing your extra points into defense. You can be stationary rather than trying to make up for the fact that you are stationary so you need a stupid amount of defense while also not having enough damage because you have to put everything into defense. So that actually makes the uh, things like, I believe incinerate, Func that would make them function a lot better. And I mean, you don't even need to use a channeling skill there. You can just stand still and use a different skill while there's damage over time skill on them. Like, you don't even have to do it that way. Like, there's so many possible options with that. What I'd really love to see in this game, something I'd really, really love, is an active channeled, a channeled defensive skill. Something that makes you stronger by channeling it, so you can apply damage over time, and then channel your defensive skill, keeping you stationary. Because that would perfectly, perfectly support this. That'd be great. God, this makes me want to play Chieftain. Uh, I already have, like, an idea for a build for next league, so I, I don't know if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna pick either of these things, but... All these changes do make me so excited for these things, like a build for, for the Sentinels of Radiance sounds awesome, or just uh, any totem build, or just any fire build, oh, there's just so many good options. I'm really excited for this league, this stuff really, this stuff is really good. Become a champion. Celebrate the release of Trials of the Ancestors, we'll be hosting a boss kill event. To enter, you will need to create a hardcore solo self-found character in the Ancestor League, and race to kill all seven pinnacle bosses on the same character. I don't care. And then, just mecha transaction crap. Well, yeah, okay, I'm very excited. I, if I don't go with my current plan for a build, then, and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, because I'd rather that be a surprise for when I start streaming it, because I will be streaming it eventually on twitch.tv slash blackcatstudio, and I will put it up on the channel here too. Then I'll probably go with a chieftain. Just, it sounds so much fun to go with that ascendancy. Like, I've always loved things that have inherent explosions to them, so that sounds freaking awesome. There's got to be something that I could play that'll be fun with that so I'm I'm very excited for this league I think it's going to be an awesome league thank you all for watching this today 
remember to follow the Twitch channel and subscribe to the YouTube. You can also join our Discord. Information's on the channel itself. And I hope to see you all in the stream when this league launches. Have a great day, everyone.